The committee will reconvene. Let me remind the witness that he's still under oath. I yield five minutes at this time to Congressman Foster of Illinois. Hi. Well, thank you, Chairman and Mr. Paulson, for, for your time here. Um, let's see, before I get into my main line of questioning, I was wondering if you could be of help in clearing up something that actually it's um, a public statement on the Minority Side website from this committee that um, having to do with the, the CPP program and, and its um, uh, its origins. And it, it says, it contains, among other things, the statement that yet under pressure from the House Democrats, such as Nancy Pelosi and Barney Frank, the Bush Secretary Paulson, um, Bush Treasury Secretary Paulson, partially nationalized the U.S. banking sector, despite his own misgivings about the inevitable perverse consequences to follow. And I was wondering um, if that um, is a reasonable characterization of, of the origins as you saw it. No, it's uh, categorically untrue. Uh, the facts are, we went to Congress to get the TARP legislation. Our primary thrust was the purchase of illiquid assets. That was the really the source of the problem, and that was our, our strong intent. We, we got additional flexibility. After the legislation, it was clear that the problem was continuing to get worse. The facts were changing. Banks were failing around the world, and and... There was quite a problem. We needed to move quickly to really put out the fire. And the by far the best idea, and the only way we could think of, of doing it was with this program. Uh, it was not uh, a nationalization of the banks. a matter of fact, the program that we implemented when I was here had preferred stocks, uh, preferred stocks, which, you know, they, they don't vote. They're, it was, they're, they're minority positions. And I have always said that this is something that would be abhorrent to me, nationalization. But we did some things in a number of any kind of government intervention was not something I came to Washington to do, but it was better than the alternative. But we switched gears, and fortunately, Congress gave us the flexibility to do what we needed to do, which was to keep prevent the American people from, from really ha having a very serious problem. Yes. Um, well, thank you for clearing that up. And I um, also voted um, you know, for the TARP authority, um, recognized at the time that this was a very important feature of it, that if things continue to get worse, that the only thing you could do fast was a rapid capital injection, and that this was an important um, element of it. And so thank you for clearing that up. Um, now, I'm interested in exploring the principle that you seem to be bringing forth in terms of that in times of systemic risk, that there are conditions under which the shareholders of a systemically important firm might be expected to take a bullet, so to speak, for the good of the overall financial system on the grounds that the firm, like everyone else, has much to lose if the financial system collapses. Um, and that, moreover, that, that you know, threats from Fed regulators are appropriate means of encouraging them to take that bullet. And is, is this a reasonable, though a little bit perhaps stilted, characteristic, characterization of your position on this? Uh, yeah, th that is not my uh, characterization at all, because we, we were very fortunate in this situation to have an alignment of interests here, because I have no doubt what was in the best interest of the public, which was to not have... Bank America collapse, not have Merrill Lynch collapse, right. not I have the financial right. system. I happen to believe, and I, I think Ken Lewis testified, he believes that that was uh, in, in also in alignment of interest with Bank America and, and Merrill Lynch. I, I, I believe that if, if Bank of America had invoked a MAC, tried to evoke a MAC, which was a legally binding contract, right. and then it was not legally valid. I think the merger contract but, but was... still, you asked them to not pursue... Um, you know, they certainly had the legal right to try to yeah. invoke it. Right. And, and you had used what, um, you know, basically, you know, what could be, I guess, characterized as an, at least an indirect threat to encourage them not to attempt to exercise their legal rights. And I was wondering if you see that there is need for additional legal clarity in this area. Well, I, I could say I think the more legal clarity we have, the better on everything. But uh, on this, I just want to come back to the MAC because I've heard people discuss this a lot. No one has ever dealt with, as far as I've heard, on the other side, the basic issue. Show me a Delaware court that after shareholders have voted has let a company get out of a merger by invoking a MAC. And this MAC, 
uh, actually had a carve out for changing in market conditions. Yeah, but your argument with that it was unlikely, not impossible, and certainly this were, these were circumstances like Delaware yeah. courts have not seen in the recent yeah. past. And, and so are, are there specific issues of legal clarity? Um, you know, for example, um, some sort of safe harbor for CEOs that act in ways that, that might be construed under normal times as being against their shareholders' interest, but because this is a time of systemic risk and they have been given direct orders by the regulators trying to avert systemic risk, do you see any merit in that kind of, of – That is something that I have it, – it's a very complicated issue. Mm -hmm. And it's one that I really don't feel qualified to have, have thought through all the arguments on, on this. But it is certainly one, I think, that, that, that bears consideration. Okay. Well, thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen, <coughs> Mr. McHenry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Secretary Paulson, thank you for your service to your country. Uh, this hearing is about the actions that took place in regard to one deal that uh, we actually have a good bit of disclosure on because the New York Attorney General's, um, uh, in essence, uh, public, now public testimony about what occurred with that. The reason why we're having these hearings is about the ramifications for the financial industry going forward. We want to make sure that government officials are really in keeping uh, with what is appropriate. Um, and, and so that's why this hearing is occurring today. Um, now, you've, you've had a long history in the financial marketplace as chairman of Goldman Sachs. Um, and, you know, a couple of these great quotes uh, about your service and your actions on Wall Street. Um, you know, one quote that I think says a lot is a Jim Citrin uh, column from September last year. He says, uh, describing you as direct, intense, powerful, serious, competitive, can-do, and frankly, ballsy. Uh, one of his former Goldman executive committee, committee members said, quote, Hank hasn't changed at all since he was at Goldman, literally. Um, there's no question um, by financial analysts or reporters or this committee members about your capacity to finish a deal. Um, and I don't think the president had any concerns about that when he, when he uh, offered you the job. Um, and, you know, another uh, Fortune magazine described you as, uh, back in 03, as the investment community's steel, uh, uh, steeliest, stealthiest power brokers. I mean, we get the deal. You, you have the capacity to get a deal done. Now, as chairman of the Federal, uh, I'm sorry, as, as chairman uh, of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke had a set, different set of powers than you had as Treasury Secretary. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. So, as Secretary of the Treasury, did you have the statutory authority to fire? Uh, actually, Mr. Shock, if you'll, thanks. Uh, you don't make much of a window, Aaron. Um, but as uh, Treasury Secretary, did you have the statutory authority to fire the Board of Directors of Bank of America? No. Okay. No. So, in your testimony, you say that you – I mentioned the possibility that the Federal Reserve could remove management and the, board of, uh, and the Board of Bank of America if the bank invoked the MAC clause. So, in essence, you were carrying a message uh, from the Federal Reserve. Is that a good way to characterize this? Well, I, I, would, I would prefer to characterize it the, the way I had characterized it earlier. I had, uh, I had had a comprehensive conversation with Ken Lewis in which I reaffirmed the support that he was going to receive from go the government because we we're committed to every systemically important institution. And that, uh, and that support is also Fed, Treasury, he, the yeah, whole it, regulatory It's combined. Game. And so we were and, – and I, I expressed the view, uh, and, and I expressed it in strong language, that the MAC was not a legally uh, valid option in the judgment of the Federal Reserve lawyers and that expressed the judgment that if he, he were to go ahead and do something like this and endanger – his company, Merrill Lynch, and the system, it would be a, it would be a lack of judgment. And then I explained to him uh, 
you know, I explained to him that the Federal Reserve had the authority to re- replace management and the board. That's a supervisory authority. And, and that last phrase that you said there, that you relayed the Fed's authority to replace the board, had, had you had discussions with the Feds and your staff had discussions with the Fed that that was within their capacity? Well, what, what I, I, mean, what I have uh, said earlier, and I will repeat it, that, that I, I have no recollection of Ben Bernanke having ever talked with me about, directly about that authority. I do have, I participated on a number of, uh, of calls and meetings where there was staffed together, and I don't remember whether I heard someone expressly say that or whether it was just the tone and the forcefulness of that discussion. But I clearly had that understanding, and I think that understanding has been borne out by the, uh, by the emails the committee has released and, and sure. some other things. At when Mr. Issa asked you in the second set of questions here uh, about this, you said, I ex- we explain the Fed's statutory authority. Right. Now, did your lawyers say this, or was it the Fed lawyers that said that? Is that hard to recall? As, as I said to you, the, I had that understanding. As you can imagine, when I'm participating in as many discussions and calls, it's different. And, and what, I've, what I've told you is I don't remember whether someone expressly mentioned that to me in, in so many words or whether it just was a logical conclusion because if, if you had heard the discussions that I'd heard where if you, you're running a regulated bank and your regulator says, we don't think this is legally valid, we think if you do this, you're going to uh, cause great harm to your company and to the financial system, it'll be a lack of judgment. And then if someone goes ahead and does that, it's a pretty logical conclusion that maybe even the regulator would be irresponsible if they didn't, sure. if they didn't hold them accountable. My, my time is short. And just one final... Oh, my time has expired. Well, I, I've got additional questions. I hope that we'll have an additional round, Madam Chair. Thank you. Letting the gentleman finish his line of inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Paulson, thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Paulson, I think that you would agree with me that uh, I'm going back to some questions Mr. Kanjorski asked you. You would agree with, with me, even with those emergency circumstances that you found yourself in, there's no reason to suspend ethical behavior, is there? No, I, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. No, absolutely not. All right. And it is interesting that as I read your testimony, and I read it several times that you have expressed tremendous concern about and the people of America. I was just wondering, did you, were you aware of the, the Merrill Lynch three plus billion dollar worth of bonuses they were about to give out uh, when this deal came down? No, I wasn't. And when did you find out about those, the, that uh, three plus billion dollars in bonuses the, that the American people basically ended I up paying? Have, I have, my, my best uh, uh, memory of this was uh, sometime around the middle of January, the day or so before we were putting this, uh, this deal together, and we, when we were talking about the compensation restrictions for B of A, uh, and I'm not entirely certain, but I have a, a, a memory that someone on my staff said, and in terms of Merrill Lynch, their bonuses have already been paid. Do you think that was fair to the American people, to stockholders? And I mean, basically what ended up is that um, the American people pretty much ended up paying Merrill Lynch's $3 billion plus bonuses that were apparently given out just before this deal went through. You understand that, right? Well, I, I do understand the bonuses were paid before the deal went through. Do you think that's fair? And do you think that's ethical? In, in terms of, th- those are two different words. Well, then why don't we start with ethical first? Okay. In, in, in terms of ethical, I, I'm not sure I would call that unethical, that, uh, that, that Merrill Lynch paid out bonuses before the deal went through. Now, whether, whether that is something that should have been done is another question. Do you think it should have been done? I, I wasn't there. I didn't make the decision. I don't think I should be judging that today. 
Well, you judged everything else. You, ju you, you made a judgment with regard to Mr. Lewis. You made a judgment when you said that you felt that uh, he had, it would be a colossal lack of judgment for him to pu push the mat. You made judgments all along where you uh, made decisions affecting the American economy. So why, are you, why suddenly you wash your hands of this? I, you've, been, you've been bragging up there this morning all this time about the judgments you have made. Yes, but I, don't, I do not have all the facts on this situation. Let me ask you this. Uh, I'd like to clarify something that you testified to this morning. A, a letter we received from Mr. Benanke and handwritten notes we received under subpoena indicate that it was Mr. Lewis who first brought up the issue of receiving a bailout. Isn't it true that it was Bank of America who first brought up uh, the bailout? I, I, I'm not sure exactly how it came up, but it very well could have been. I sure know that it was with 100 percent certainty it was Bank America that came to us, said they've got the losses, and said they, they have, a, have a major problem, and, and uh, were considering, uh, considering triggering the MAC laws. All right. So in, in December of 2008, did you promise, Mr. Lewis, that you would provide Bank of America with enough capital to fill the $12 billion, quote, whole, unquote, created? Let me, let me finish. Let me answer. I want you to answer the whole question. Created by the losses at Merrill Lynch, or would it be fair to say that you at least intimated to Mr. Lewis that he could count on an amount equal to Merrill's losses in December? We weren't as specific in terms of the amount and the losses. But we more than intimated. We were uh, both uh, Ben Bernanke and I were very clear that we were committed to working with him to come up with a support program that we thought would work. Let's talk about Goldman Sachs for a moment. Let's um, immediately before becoming Secretary of Treasury, you were the chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs, were you not? Absolutely. And as Treasury and as Treasury Secretary, you asked then Goldman board member Ed Liddy to take over as head of AIG. Is that correct? Yes. Goldman has subsequently been revealed to be the largest recipient of AIG's counterparty payments, benefiting to the tune of more than $13 billion after AIG was bailed out. I note that the firm repeatedly claimed that, it, that its exposure to AIG was fully hedged and it was not material to the firm. Just this week, Goldman posted a record $3.44 billion in quarterly profits and plans to, to give out uh, uh, billions, of, millions of dollars, billions of dollars worth of bonuses to the tune of six hundred thousand dollars for twenty, on the average of twenty-eight thousand employees. I just ask you one question. This and, and this is my last question: the people in my district who are losing their homes, their insurance, the ones you talked about in your statement, their homes, your insurance, everything they've got, some of them elderly going about to work. You know what they asked me? They said, Cummings, that money that those folks are getting on Wall Street, those millions and billions, is that our money? Because our money went somewhere. We don't know where it went, but we know people are getting millions and billions of dollars. What about us? What about us who are out of work? What about us who, have to, who have to, can't send our kids to college in September after they've done everything they're supposed to do to prepare for college? What about us who don't have a house? What about us? You keep telling us that the storm is going to be over, but when the storm's over, who's going to be living in my house? What about them? And I'm asking, they're asking the question, is some of this money their money? Uh, Mr. Cummings, I want to I say, just want to be able to answer I, them when I, I go I home tonight. I want to say two things. First of all, I want you to know that I had no role whatsoever in any of the Fed's decisions regarding payments to any of AIG's uh, creditors or counterparties, number one. S secondly, what, what I would say to you is the thing that bothers you bothers me because the people that are paying the price had nothing to do with the problem. And, but the, the sad truth is that if these companies had gone down, they'd be paying a bigger price. There would be more foreclosures there would be more people that are unemployed. And so you are absolutely right in asking the question. You should keep asking the question. This is a terrible thing. And 
That's why I believe you and the other members of Congress need to work so hard to put in the kinds of regulatory reforms and the kinds of powers that we need to have in place to make sure we don't have to go through something like this again. I see my time is up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Congressman Bilbrey. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, I'm sort of sitting here listening to this testimony and all at once realizing as we're in the micro, there's a macro message here. Um, you did say the Fed has the authority to hire and fire the Board of Directors. Well, what, 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 what I said is I have an understanding that under unusual circumstances, if the Federal Reserve is dealing with a regulated entity and that there are decisions made at that regulated entity that endangers the safety and soundness of that institution, then the, the Fed has the authority to hold them accountable. Now, clearly, the, uh, in, in terms of corporate governance 101, we have a, you know, we know how boards are selected, and we know that boards uh, select management. But there, there needs to be something for regulated entities where the, the regulator can protect the safety and soundness. Well, I, I'm, I'm sensing we've moved in beyond where we've historically been. We've gone into a brave new world where now, with a de facto nationalization of the industry, um, we're sitting here as a committee considering items that in 1927, when this committee was founded, never dreamed that Washington would be determining what decisions are made in either Wall Street or Main Street. Now Washington is making those determinations. And this brave new world we ventured into of nationalizing you know, major industries um, really does place a strain on a system that was never designed to make or to make the decision or to do the oversight, as we're trying to do today. Never was perceived by the founders of this committee that we would be having this discussion. My question to you, as the Secretary, as we talk about other situations and talk about exit strategies, <coughs> where is the exit strategy? What date can I tell my constituents that we will not have this discussion anymore? We will, that this committee and Congress will not be discussing how we have influenced or directed the decisions in um, at least this major industry. When will we be out of the business of doing banking? Well, I would say, first of all, that is the major question. It's a question I ask myself, and it's a question that's easier to, to ask than it, is, than it is to answer. But it's a question you should be asking, because we as a nation needed to do some things that many of us found abhorrent, uh, they just were better than the alternative. And so once the system is stabilized and the economy is turned, then there needs to be great consideration given to how we exit this and in how we put in place those, uh, those reforms to, to really reduce they're going to be back here again doing these sorts of things. But I don't, I, I can't stand here and tell you today that I, that I have the answer to your question, but I hope it's soon. Well, let me just say, I, I think the last administration had the public turn on them because they did not have an exit strategy for another situation. Uh, regardless of who's in the making of this, if this administration doesn't develop an exit strategy, give some timelines that do not exist today. I think all of us are going to be held responsible for the fact that Washington has stepped into something has started punching in this tar baby and now has no way of extricating ourselves out of it. And we have now created a whole new environment of what is appropriate for the federal government to be doing. And we're down now having this hearing about who gets hired or fired, who is notified that if they don't do certain actions, there's going to be termination. All of these things have never been perceived as being the appropriate position for the federal government, which is now the federal government's engaged into. So extracting ourselves, um, extracting ourselves out of the situation is going to be something I think the American people can demand very soon. Madam Chair, at this time I'd like to um, yield to um, uh, the gentleman from the uh, Carolinas, if I remember right. Without objection. Uh, thank my colleague from whatever that state is in the West um, <clears throat> that's financially sound. So, um, uh, Secretary Paulson, um, just in continuation with my line of questioning, before, from, from the notes we have on your schedule from December 
19th, mid-December, December 19th is what we have. It, it, it shows you had roughly five phone calls with Dr. Bernanke, with Chairman Bernanke uh, that day. Was that fairly typical in those very busy days of uh, multiple communications, one-on-one -on -one and at the staff yeah, level? Yeah, we yeah. had, uh, I'm, I'm not sure five every day, but we had multiple conversations for, a, a, for, for seven or eight months there. And, and when you communicated with Chairman Bernanke, did you express, uh, on this day, we have, um, you know, multiple calls with Chairman Bernanke, a couple calls to Ken Lewis, uh, Thane, uh, Geithner, a number of different folks throughout the day. Did, did you describe to uh, Chairman Bernanke your conversation you had with Ken Lewis? A conversation with who? Ken Lewis. Oh, with Lewis. And my conversation on which day, the 19th? Well, w whatever day it was. I mean, did you describe the conversations you had with Ken Lewis? Oh, the, the conversation I had with Ken Lewis on the 21st. You talked to Ken Lewis multiple times in December. Oh, oh yes. There are multiple conversations where he said they were considering Mac. You said it was bad. You then came back and said, you know, yeah. Your, your microphone, I think, is off. And Can you hear me now? Communicated frequently with summarized conversations. Sure. A and at the same time, did you keep your successor, Mr. Geithner, informed? Uh, yes, in a, in, a, in a different way. Uh, that uh, Chairman Bernanke was a major decision maker. Uh, I... Uh, during this period, once uh, uh, Tim Geithner was a Secretary of Treasury designate, then we wanted a very s smooth transition, so I kept him posted on a variety of things, but I wasn't looking to him as a decision maker when I posted him. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Congressman Connolly. Thank you, Madam Chairman, <clears throat> and welcome, Secretary Paulson. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your patience today, uh, given our schedule. Um, I'd like to uh, go back just a little bit to uh, and maybe I could start following up on my colleague's question about the MAC. Um, it's our understanding that uh, not once but twice, Mr. Lewis threatened to invoke the MAC because they had discovered a $12 billion problem in the Merrill Lynch deal. Is that correct? Well, what I remembered was $18 billion pre-tax at one time and then $22 billion pre-tax at the, at the end and $15 billion after tax, but my numbers might be wrong. Okay. But. but in both cases, they threatened or discussed with you the possibility of invoking the MAC. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And your reaction, obviously negative in both instances, why? Uh, the, it, it, it was based upon uh, the view of very experienced lawyers, and again, I haven't heard this refuted elsewhere with any degree of, uh, of, of vehemence, that th that th there was a legally binding contract and that the MAC clause would not have b b been legally valid in this situation. The shareholders had voted in, for, in both companies. This was a Delaware company. But, but um, that's really a legal matter, obviously not normally involving the Secretary of Treasury. Why would you care one way or the other whether he was uh, acting on on uh, misinformation, legal misinformation, and threatening uh, I, to invoke the MAC. I, I, I normally wouldn't care, but this is, uh, but if you have a situation where a company in doing something like this in a period of uncertainty and fear uh, could do grave damage in the opinion of their regulator to that company and to the whole system, of, you know, I, 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 I sure better care. You were worried about the impact on the, a very fragile system at that time. Yeah, I was worried about the impact on the very practical system and, and also the impact on, uh, on B of A, which was the biggest bank. It, given that concern, Mr. Secretary, um, at any time in that period in, around December of 2008, did you have any conversation that could be construed explicitly or impliedly as promising uh, in exchange for their backing off the MAC threat or even going public with the $12 billion or whatever the ultimate number was, in exchange for that silence or that uh, proceeding, 
uh, forward that there would be TARP funding available to Mr. Lewis and BOA? We, we, we definitely had conversations, but it wasn't in exchange for. The, the, no matter what they did, uh, you know, I felt a responsibility. I know uh, Ben Bernanke felt the responsibility uh, to, to keep the financial system from collapsing. So this was not a situation where, gee, we'll do this big favor for you. This was a situation where we were doing this for the American people. Right. And it just so happened that, uh, that, that there was an alignment of interest because uh, B of A failure wouldn't have been good for the B of A shareholders and, either. And, and this alignment of interest, as you know, and you've heard ad nauseum here today, Mr. Lewis construed as almost a threat by you and perhaps by Mr. Bernanke. Uh, that if you didn't take the federal money to fire you and your board, uh, that's a far cry from how you characterize it as sort of a, a confluence of interest. Well, you know, I didn't uh, – I, 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 there's two different things, okay? The confluence of interest was just what I said, which was we certainly didn't want B of A to be unstable. The, the – uh, in terms of my communication with him – I've been pretty direct. I, I, I wouldn't use the word threat, but I've, I've, I've said what I said, and uh, I, I was very direct. And I, I, I intended to give a very direct, strong, clear message. And th that was – I'm not characterizing it as a threat because and, – and, and Lewis didn't characterize it as a threat, but I did explain the Fed's powers. But that was the – in terms of the confluence of interest, to me, that's just an obvious thing. If you follow the train of logic we've laid out here, you, know, you either accept the logic or you don't. I mean, some, well, peop some people will say, well, there was no crisis, nothing would have happened to B of A, nothing would have happened to Merrill Lynch, nothing would happen to the financial system. I can't satisfy those people. Yes, those and, and I'm with you, Mr. Secretary. I, there was a crisis, and I understand where you and the uh, Federal Reserve uh, Chairman were coming from. But I guess we're trying to understand, and I see my time is up, Madam Chairman. Uh, I hope I have the opportunity to return to some specific questions regarding the terms, conditions of, uh, of the agreement to go forward with TARP funding. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Schock? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, following up on Mr. McHenry's questions about um, Tim Geithner's involvement uh, in this, you stated that you kept him, uh, uh, once he was nominated, you kept him informed. Um, however, we have notes from uh, Joe Price, who is the Chief Financial Officer for uh, Bank of America, uh, basically chronicling the conversation that you had with Chairman Lewis uh, and yourself. Uh, and in those, uh, those documents, he, he says, quote, Fire BOD if you do it, irresponsible for country, Board of Directors. Tim G. agrees. In those conversations, did you ever uh, invoke Tim Geithner's name uh, or suggest in any ways that he was on board with uh, your view on this to apply additional pressure to Mr. Lewis or Bank yeah. of America? I, I tell you, I, I've sure got no, mem I've sure got no uh, uh, memory of that, just none whatsoever. You yes. don't remember m I don't, mentioning Tim Geithner I, I, in the conversation I, 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 I with Mr. Lewis? I, I don't remember it. Those are, uh, you know, th those are Joe Price's notes, and, and someone would have to, to, to ask him. I don't, I don't even remember talking to Joe Price. I, I remember talking with, with, with Ken Lewis, and as I said, I, uh, I posted uh, Geithner. I, I, I didn't look, look, look at him as a decision maker, and I... I, I just don't have a uh, memory of uh, in that kind of detail. So you would never have you you never used him to your recollection as as additional pressure that he was on board. Uh, yeah, I don't. I, I sure don't recall that. Okay, there seems to be a lot of confusion, or seems we're arguing over semantics over uh, your, your whether or not you threatened Mr. Lewis or Bank of America, and I, I don't think it's necessary that we argue over the semantics of a threat. I think you've been very clear, at least in your earlier testimony, uh, that. Uh, if they went forward with invoking the MAC, that you would have moved forward with attempting to remove him from his position? Well, I wouldn't have moved forward. I did not have the authority to do that. that. What, 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 what I said to him 
was I said to him, if he did something so irresponsible, uh, you and know, that I, was, I, in I, your I, view, I, 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 believe, I believe the Fed could do that as his regulator. And, and, and you further clarified that you felt that would be irresponsible, invoking the MAC. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Very be, clear. Okay, that, that is clear. Okay. So what, maybe threat isn't the correct word. Maybe he, was, he, he felt pressure. There, there was, I mean, is that a fair term that, well, that he was? I'll let you, I'd rather just tell you what I said and let you characterize it. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, I would like you to respond then to Mr. Bernanke's testimony. Um, Chairman Issa, or, or Ranking Member Issa, asked him if there were threats, uh, which I know we don't like that term, or if people felt threatened to go through with the deals, it's okay because it worked out. Do you agree with that? Bernanke responded, no, sir. In other words, it would not be appropriate for uh, Ken Lewis and Bank of America to feel pressured. Given Bernanke's acknowledgment at our last hearing that, that threatening to fire Bank of America's management to get them to go through with the merger would have been inappropriate, are you prepared then to take responsibility for issuing such an inappropriate statement? I, I'll tell you, I, I certainly uh, take responsibility for what I said. And uh, w what I said, I think it logically followed from, uh, I, I laid out a train of events, and I think it logically followed that's what the, that's what a regulator should do. Uh, I, I would say I think uh, Chairman Bernanke, when he testified uh, here, you know, last month, I think he acknowledged that if someone put their, uh, made a decision that harmed their company, they deserve to be held accountable. And, uh, and that, that's certainly what I was, uh, what I was trying to uh, communicate to, uh, to, uh, to Ken Lewis. You stated earlier that you took issue with a Bank of America's reason for invoking the MAC. Did you ever personally read their, uh, their legal justification? No. Nope. And you stated that you relied on the legal basis, uh, or, or um, uh, rather uh, the Fed's legal staff, for their view on the MAC as your justification. Are you aware, do you know the names of the legal staff that you relied on? I, I listened in and participated in uh, a number of calls where I heard the legal staff and, uh, you know, I, I do know some of the people, yes. Do you know if any of that legal staff had background or experience in merger, mergers and acquisitions? I, I, I know they were experienced uh, uh, lawyers. I do not know their specific experience. Well, in I mean, merger. come on now. There's a difference between being an experienced uh, well, lawyer uh, and an experienced uh, lawyer in mergers well, and acquisitions well, uh, that would know whether or not a company has the legal basis uh, to invoke I'll the I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one other thing, okay? One other, one other test. I've participated in deals and in markets for 32 years, and when I hear a lawyer say uh, to, to a company, what's your legal justification? After, a, after two shareholder votes and with a MAC that's structured this way, and I'm not getting very much back on the other side, and I'll, I'll tell you something, as someone who's been around in the markets, uh, uh, everything th that I heard squared with, with, with my instincts and judgments. Were you aware that Bank of America had successfully invoked the MAC less than a year earlier on the Sally May deal? Was, was it after shareholder votes in a Delaware company? Well, I guess what I'm trying to understand is if they, if, time has, if, if they legally had, had justification and legal expertise to invoke the MAC clause once, I would, I would question why they would come forward and justify that they, they could do it in this instance and be wrong. I've told you how I made my judgment, and, and that's how I made the judgment, and I think it was the right judgment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlewoman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yeah. Secretary, uh, some contend the timing of what you call in your testimony a finan fin financial crisis unprecedented uh, in our lifetime was actually a calculated Wall Street scenario underpinned with masterful deceit and extraordinary moral hazard. Your clarion call for the taxpayer bailout of Wall Street's excess came six weeks before a major national election when our government is the most vulnerable uh, and tender and Congress skittish. What your orchestration yielded was an unprecedented dumping 
of private sector losses on the U.S. taxpayer. History will show that the U.S. government and you knew about Wall Street's growing losses long before the Bank of America Merrill merger. In fact, Bank of America's purchase of Countrywide in January of 2008 was but another positioning of private sector interests in preparation for what I call the greatest Hail Mary pass of all time in taking those Wall Street losses and placing them on the next three generations. What interests me is who you helped and who you didn't. Yesterday's New York Times uh, reports that Goldman Sachs, the firm at which you spent your life, posted the largest quarterly profit in its 140-year history, $3.4 billion. Each Goldman employee uh, reportedly could earn $770,000 this year. And the same paper's lead editorial yesterday states, across our nation, unemployment is rising, foreclosures are surging, lending is still constrained. I wish I had an hour to talk to you about that. It looks like some very rich people are profiting handsomely. And uh, I can tell you that those profits at Goldman, they'd resolve about one quarter of the housing uh, situation in Ohio that we face today. Uh, since appointment by President Bush as Secretary of Treasury in 2006 until today, have you or any of your family had any financial ties or investments related to Goldman Sachs in any way whatsoever? Uh, no. Thank you. What about Bank of America? Uh, n not that no. I know of. President Bush was not the first president you served. Who was the first president you served? Uh, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon. And who did you report to in the White House in those days? Uh, Who is the head of your staff? I reported first to Lou Ingman and then to John Ehrlichman. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you about the deals you structured while at Treasury. Um, in terms of the warrants that you structured in the $10 billion Goldman Sachs deal, the term sheet provides that once Goldman redeemed the preferred shares, it has the option to purchase back the warrants at a fair market value at a timing of its discretion. Why did you draft a provision that allowed Goldman Sachs, the borrower, to determine when the taxpayers must sell their warrants? The, you know, in terms of how a specific uh, warrant deal was structured, I, I'm sure that the deal that was structured for Goldman was the same as for, for all the other warrants. But why would you leave the taxpayer, who in this instance is the creditor, why would you let the borrower set the terms? The... I would, I would say this, uh, ma Madam Congresswoman, the, th those warrants are going to be very profitable for the taxpayers. Yes, they're going to be very profitable, sir, but if Goldman can set the terms on when they can be redeemed, we're not going to get back what we deserve to get back for the American oh, there, people. There, there, there's, a process, there's a process, and it's not a process where Goldman Sachs sets the terms. Well, that's it's not, not a what process the deal says. Where any the term sets sheet the terms. provides that at a timing of its discretion, that's okay. what the term. Could you check okay. into that for me with your okay, friends? Okay, well, I will check into it. But the timing is one thing. The process for how that's set is another. Well, I, I don't know how you're defining your terms there, but it's pretty clear that Goldman Sachs will determine when our taxpayers, when we will get our money back and what we're going to That's a pretty serious question. Let me go to another point here. And this is who you help and who you don't help. Last year, Warren Buffett bought into Goldman Sachs at a level of $5 billion. Under your watch as Secretary of Treasury, our taxpayers were forced to invest $10 billion in Goldman, not counting the counterparty uh, deal with AIG. Warren Buffett received 43.5 million options worth $1.8 billion for his $5 billion gamble. Okay, our taxpayers, by contrast, got 9.5 million options worth $500 million, one-fifth as much for their investment, which was double his. Buffett is being paid 10% interest on his preferred stock. Yet taxpayers only get 5% for the first five years and 9% for the second five years. Buffett has a 10% call premium. Taxpayers have no premium rights. Buffett got $5 billion of present value for his $5 billion investment. Taxpayers have $4.9 billion of present value for their $10 billion dollar investment. How is this fair? And why did Warren Buffett get a better deal for his stockholders than you as Secretary of Treasury got for the American taxpayer at Goldman? There's a very clear reason why. When we structured the capital to go into all of the banks, it was the middle of a crisis. Uh, attractive capital was not available. 
the reason we had to do this is capital was not available. We wanted to do something that was available, not where we were providing it under duress, but providing capital which was structured so that the taxpayer would get paid back. The capital we put out At was, the call of Goldman, whenever well, it sets the terms. First of all, the banks, we, we put out the capital. It's preferred stock. It wasn't voting. Uh, it was 5% initially, so the taxpayer is going to get paid back all of that money, 5% interest and warrants, as various firms and a number of firms have done well and have paid, paid back. But we were not. You do not stop, Madam Congresswoman, you do not stop a, a financial panic by, by putting uh, capital and offering capital to banks on the terms, the only terms that it's available in the middle of a crisis. So what we were doing was moving quickly to put capital to a range of major financial institutions that were picked because they were systemically important. And I would also argue to you that the fact that a number of those institutions have done well and – Oh, they've are, done very and, well, and, and, Mr. And have paid back oh, the yes, taxpayer is something we should all be pleased about rather than the reverse. Well, you know, I wish you'd gotten a better deal for the taxpayers. You sure, certainly got a good deal for a lot of your former clients. Well, I have additional questions, Mr. I, Chairman. I would say to you, I, I think if you look at what the taxpayer is going to make on a number of these companies, it will have been good. But the biggest advantage to the taxpayer – by far the biggest advantage to the taxpayer is what didn't happen, and that we did not have a collapse, and we did not have a double the number of foreclosures in Ohio and double the level of... Oh, they're, uh, they're uh, happening, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Paulson. <coughs> you, you ought to come and visit us in Ohio and see the results of your handiwork. Well, I know how terrible it is. I'm just telling you it would have been worse. Well, That's your best argument. That's not good enough. Yeah, well, well, okay, get a woman's see, time to you because we, we, you probably don't agree there was a crisis. Gentleman from Mr. Fortenberry. I agree Rest. it was a crisis of your making for very, for uh, very Get a woman's uh, time has expired. Uh, thank you. Comments from Fortenberry from thank you. Nebraska. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, hello, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for joining us yeah. today. Uh, in your testimony, you stated that uh, you would like Congress to create a new regulatory framework to be able to intervene and facilitate the orderly wind-down of a systemically important institution. What do you envision? Well, I think something very similar to what has been suggested by the Obama administration makes sense, because the there needs to be when there is a when there is a real systemic risk so this should not be done frivolously when the system is at risk there needs to be a way to uh, to avoid the normal bankruptcy process and let a regulatory body come in and handle the wind down of the liabilities in such a way as it does not prevent a uh, a, a, a real danger to the to, to the public and the financial system, and if if we have a different regulatory regime, and if this authority is structured properly, then we won't be in a situation where institutions are too big to fail. Well, in that regard, what role do you foresee for the Treasury, for the Fed, for the FDIC? Well, there, there's been a, there have been a number of things that have been suggested. What, what we had suggested as part of the regulatory blueprint was a, the Fed playing the role of a macro stability regulator, being able to look across the, uh, the, um, the, the whole economy and look across the capital markets for risks, uh, being able to access and get information and being and having the authorities to act in in, in terms of the wind down uh it, it if, if there's a a potential failure i think there needs to be a high bar so there there would need to be a determination by the the the, the secretary of the treasury uh you know by the by the chairman of the fed by by other regulators that there is a true systemic issue. So this should not be an easy bar to get over. But when there is, then the, the, then the regulator needs, needs all of the powers to, 
to, uh, to, to handle that wind down. Given all of the turmoil in the economy in the last year, given the government's intervention, uh, we're now left with the reality that 10 banks in this country control about 50 percent of the deposited assets. Is that a systemic risk in your view? It, it, it is something that makes me uncomfortable. So how and, would we and, proceed? How would this new regulatory framework look at that potential situation? Well, just as, I, that as I said, what and I'm, I'm just only going to deal with things that I said. I'm saying nothing now that I didn't say when I was Treasury Secretary. We put forward a regulatory blueprint which called for greater consolidation of the banking regulation uh, as opposed to the multiple uh, regulators. And so I, I think having, uh, having greater consolidation and, and stronger regulation uh, coupled with the wind down powers so that you don't have banks or bank holding companies being too big to fail, I think is a, is, is a meaningful way of dealing with the risk because in my judgment, a regulation, no matter how good, is always going to be imperfect. And so you need to have it in balance with the moral, the market discipline or moral hazard uh, that we got to a, to a point where we couldn't rely on market discipline or moral hazard because it would have taken the system down. Uh, but to the extent the, the infrastructure in, in the financial markets are, are fixed, and I'm talking about the tri-party repo market, uh, credit default swaps, and there's a lot of work that's being done there, and you have the wind-down powers, uh, and, and so then we're not held hostage by institutions that are too big to fail, I, I think there's, there, there's an opportunity to get the balance right. Just to let you know, we've uh, changed the expression too big to fail to too big to succeed, and that's part of the uh, intention that I have in simply asking you the question, are we now in a place where we, because of debatable actions, uh, and, and I've heard you clearly in your justifications, and I'm not trying to play gotcha here or anything, just looking ahead to say, are we now in a situation where the actions that were taken to try to stabilize the economy has left us with further vulnerability uh, and the potential for a systemic failure because of this uh, highly concentrated control of the financial system in the hands of a few? I understand your question. And th there's going to be, because when you look at the number of banks, there's going to be a, a lot more consolidation before we're done. But I, I, I do understand your question, and I think it's important we get this in balance. All right. Thank the you, gentlemen, Mr. Secretary. Thank time has expired. Uh, Congressman Clay from Missouri for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Paulson, for your candor today. Uh, hopefully we can continue in that vein. Um, Secretary Paulson and I have noted uh, with great interest of your evolution from a proponent of no government interference in the free markets uh, to a person who believes that government does and should have a role in the markets. I find that enlightening, somewhat welcoming, and also contradictory, often at the same time. However, today I have questions on why uh, we have companies that are too big to fail. I don't believe that. Many don't believe that. Of those that you obvious, obviously think are or were too big to fail, uh, what distinguishes them from others? Why was Lehman Brothers allowed to fail and Merrill Lynch and Bank of America were not? What were the differences in systemic risk? Uh, to the country in making the decision to rescue uh, the latter and not the former, and why rescue and assist Goldman Sachs and not Lehman Brothers? Well, let me, uh, you know, and I went through this uh, earlier, and I'll, I'll go through it again. At the time when uh, Lehman was failing, we didn't have the TARP, so we had no we had no authority to put uh, capital into the in, into Lehman Brothers, and we were unsuccessful in finding a buyer. And in the case of of Bear Stearns, 
we had a buyer in J.P. Morgan, and the government could assist that buyer, but, but J.P. Morgan was providing the capital and able to uh, guarantee the trading book. Uh, and, uh, AIG? But, but in, in a, talk about yeah, AIG? And, and, and let me talk about AIG, because AIG is, mm -hmm. is another one which was different. In AIG, it was perceived as being a liquidity problem, but we had at, at the uh, insurance company level, regulated insurance companies that were well capitalized, perceived as being stable. And so the Fed could solve the liquidity problem by loaning against th those insurance company assets, and the market accepted that. Lehman Brothers had a capital hole and a liquidity problem, and we had been working with a group of industry participants to help f finance a deal if we could get a buyer. And we were unsuccessful at getting that buyer. And so the once we had the TARP in place, we had other tools in the toolkit. And I do, there, there's been a lot of confusion. For instance, people will say the Fed made a loan to Lehman Brothers after they failed against that collateral. That's true. The Fed made a loan, and that was to facilitate a liquidation and a bankruptcy. A Fed loan to Lehman Brothers uh, by itself would not have filled the capital hole, would not have taken care of the trading book guarantee, and would not have, not have prevented a bankruptcy. So after Bear Stearns went, uh, if you look at the record, you will look at the, the fact that, that Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson each gave a number of speeches where we said, we don't have the authorities that are necessary to deal with non-banking institutions, financial institutions. So the, but, but your question gets asked by a lot of people because it, these, are, these, these were, were complicated issues. But, yeah, but, but let me, look, look. Let me, let me tell you what my constituents are feeling. You know, we gave AIG $180 billion on, because they were irresponsible, because they took risk, because they created these exotic products and, 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 and enriched themselves. They were irresponsible, and yet they get rewarded through our tax dollar. Now we own them. I mean, so when does it stop, and, 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 and then what is the punishment for their irresponsibility? Uh, uh, Congressman, I can't tell you how much it pains me to be on the other side of this conversation, because I can't tell you how angry I was when, when I sat there uh, on that weekend in September where the management team came in and laid out the issues. Uh, so this is, and you're absolutely right, the, uh, but there was a situation where we had essentially an unregulated uh, hedge fund on top of insurance companies. There was a huge gap in our regulatory system. This should never have been allowed to happen. It did happen. All I can say to you is you will never be able to explain that so your constituents can understand it. And that's a good thing, because we don't want to have to understand this in this country. We don't want to be in a situation where this can happen again. But all I can tell, say to you is, I believe if the Fed had not have taken that action, given the size of AIG, we would have had a global banking run, we would have had a financial system meltdown, the wealth that would have been lost in 401k programs, saving plans, uh, the wealth that would have been destroyed in this country w w would have been, it, 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 it was tragic. So the, but, but now you have a situation where the government is an owner, the government is there, and we have to be careful we don't draw the line between trying to punish them and shooting ourselves and the taxpayer in the foot. Because right now we should all want AIG to do well. Yeah, the time has expired. Yeah. You sure? I had five minutes. Uh, in fact, you had seven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. I ask unanimous consent that Mr. Stearns and Mr. Garrett be allowed to participate 
and of course, um, without objection, so ordered. And I now Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. And uh, Mr. Paulson, I hear your pain when you said you're just pained to be on that side of the table answering the gentleman's question. But isn't it true that uh, Goldman Sachs benefited from AIG bailout? They got $13 billion and was the largest uh, recipient of the public funds from AIG. And in fact, creating the uh, collateralized debt obligation, the CDOs, formed the basis of the current crisis we have today. But while you were C CEO of Goldman Sachs, you were an active part of that business. So my problem is when you say you're paying by AIG, I go back to your bait and switch when you came here to Congress and you suddenly decided instead of buying the toxic loans, you're going to go out and start to give money to these people. So if you didn't have any credibility on the bait and switch, how do you have any credibility today to come before us and tell us that you're paying by AIG? Well, l let me respond. Do you understand the credibility you have? You came here, you said in this two and a half page bill that you wanted $750 billion. Then immediately after you got approval from Congress, you changed it. You baited us on, then you switched it, and then you started giving money to these institutions, the top 15 institutions. When all these, bank, these people who had the loans, you could have worked out a homeowner's equity plan around this country to help the people who are actually having their homes foreclosed. And you're helping AIG, and you're helping Bank of America, and you're, you're bankrupting Lehman Brothers, who is your biggest competition. Isn't there some point you should have recused yourself and said, you know something, all my buddies and Goldman Sachs are over there. You know, I really feel that I shouldn't be making these decisions to make Lehman Brothers go bankrupt, that I really should recuse myself. And the fact is that you're coming here and say you feel the pain of AIG uh, is just, it's just outrageous. Well, well, I would like to respond to you, Congressman, because I find your statement outrageous. Uh, so okay, much. Mr. Paulson. Well, let me tell you, I have the time, Mr. Paulson. Let me just say one do other I, thing. No, 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 I just want you to speak into the mic. Pull the oh, mic okay. to you. Let, so, me just, let me just say one other thing here. You know, when you look at, you're saying to us, you support the Obama administration giving more power to the federal regulatory, the, the, the Fed. But, but when you look, the Fed was on, Geithner was on board at the Fed, the New York Fed, dealing with all these institutions. He didn't get it. And then we had this uh, fellow who came up afterwards, Mr. Friedman. He was on the Goldman Sachs board, and uh, he didn't last too long as the Fed chairman. Why? Because he had a conflict of interest. Is it possible that there's so much conflict of interest here that all you folks don't even realize that you're helping people that you're associated with, and you should be recusing yourself for America's uh, ethics? Uh, let me make several comments. The first comment I will say is I came to Congress I asked for the TARP, and I asked for, a, uh, for authority to purchase illiquid assets. We but got, in 10 we got days, you changed your opinion. We changed because the situation changed dramatically. In 10 days? Y you betcha. If you look at what happened in that 10-day period, you look at what happened around the world, it changed dramatically. Number one. Uh, secondly, I don't want you to use all my time. Uh, was, okay, just second, your, your but I want, I want to just respond to uh, secondly. Uh, I left Goldman Sachs. I sold my shares in Goldman Sachs. Tax I, deferred, too. I, I, you didn't I, have to pay any tax on I, your $200 million. I, I sold my Isn't shares in, in Goldman Sachs. I, I, the clause that if you come into the administration, you sell your assets, it's tax deferred. You don't have to pay 200. If you had $200 million profit, and you didn't have to pay any tax. Isn't that true? Listen, it's, it's is not that a, true it's, or not? It's, yes or it no? Is, you do not pay a profit when someone, a, a, a tax when someone well, makes you sell assets. Maybe that was for you to become Secretary of Treasury so you didn't have to pay the tax there. Oh. The next thing I would say to you, and say it very, very clearly, is uh, I... Uh, you know, I b behaved with the... Uh, with you don't the think you should have recused yourself when you asked Lehman to go in bankruptcy, you didn't put Bear Stearns in bankruptcy, and then you folded Merrill Lynch into... I mean, isn't there some point where you've got to say, hey, I've got a conflict of interest here? You don't feel any kind of scintilla of ethics on this thing at all? Uh, totally. I, I, I operated very consistently with the, in the ethic guidelines I had as Secretary of the Treasury, and when it became uh, when it became clear that that uh, we had some very significant issues 
with Goldman Sachs and with, with, with Why didn't you recuse with, yourself with Morgan then? Stanley? What I did then, it would have been very wrong for me to recuse myself. What I did was I went and got a waiver from the ethics agreement because when we had concerns. Who was in of, charge of the ethics agreement? What? Who's in charge of the ethics agreement we, that you got a waiver? We, we have we have a uh, office of of ethics at Treasury and we have a White House ethics office. So you got it from the legal counsel from the White House? We, we, we got it from the, uh, the, the government ethics office. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, yeah. for your courtesy. And I ask you now to consent my opening statement to be part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. Yeah. The Congresswoman from California, Congressman Diane Watson. Uh, Mr. Bolson, I want to thank you for being here and your patience. Uh, a few minutes ago, we talked about an institution that you thought uh, would be able to deal with uh, regulatory uh, activities. Uh, how do you feel about the regulatory proposals that have been put forth by President Obama and Congress? That's a pretty broad general question. Um, Have you been following them? I, I would say I made, uh, when I was Secretary of the Treasury, I put forward a number of, uh, of, of regulatory proposals, put forward a regulatory blueprint. And there are a number of things that the, the administration has put forward that, that I am very, very pleased about. Uh, the wind-down authorities for non-banking institutions, uh, the, the idea that there be a macro-stability regulator, the idea that there be a consolidation of banking regulators. So I, I think there's some very positive ideas that have been put forward. Uh, would you please, uh, if we send you the exact uh, questions, would you put your responses in writing so I can say that when we form this new regulatory system, these are some of the points that we ought to consider. We're trying to unscramble eggs that are really rotten at this point. And we must move forward and correct this system. Uh, it's impacting on not only the United States, but the rest of the world, too. We got to get it right. And I don't, I cannot be convinced that this wasn't seen back a year ago, uh, the collapse. But in trying to move on, uh, I want to reiterate what has happened uh, on Tuesday. It was reported that just one month after repaying their $10 billion in aid, Goldman Sachs would be posting a second quarter net profit of $3.44 billion. I'm curious to hear your perspective on their success despite the recession given your 26 years of experience at Goldman Sachs and the unique, unique role former Goldman employees have played in economic policy, considering that the last two chairmen of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the head of the World Bank, and the head of the New York Stock Exchange, and the former assistant uh, secretary at Treasury responsible for TARP, Neil Kaskari were all former Goldman Sachs employees. And why do you believe Goldman Sachs has been able to bring in such profits despite the current economic conditions? Yeah, I, I don't have an answer for you. I have not uh, worked at Goldman Sachs in three years, so I, I can't uh, explain what, what they're doing that's working. Uh, but, but, but I can say uh, I, I take some comfort, and I, I, th I think all of you should, that there are a number of financial institutions that are, that, that, that are more profitable today, and it looks increasingly like the government will be paid back with profits on, on, on a number of these plans. And in terms of your request to me to, uh, to, to give you something in writing, I will, I'll work with you on that. I don't have a staff like I used to, and I have a lot of requests. No, you can handwrite them. I do have a staff, but, 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 and we'll send you in writing uh, what we would like to uh, ask and what 
you think should be proposed, you can write it in hand. You can do pencil to paper. We'll be. Well, 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 I'll, I'll do my best to work with you on it. Thank you. All right. I appreciate that. And um, do you think that uh, Goldman Sachs has benefited from the economic crisis and the dissolution of some of their strongest competitors, such as Lehman Brothers? I don't. Uh, I, I, I don't uh, know what is the source of the profits, and and I, I've got no basis to speculate on it. Okay. How was uh, the ter the determination made that institutions such as Bear Stearns, AIG, and Merrill Lynch should be saved, either through direct assistance or acquisition, while Lehman Brothers would be allowed to fail? I, I'm not quite clear, and I know you've addressed it. Yeah, I, I did, and I can, I, I, I will just say to you, we, we did not have the legal powers, we believe, to do something in the Lehman Brothers case. We did not have uh, the TARP to put capital in, and we did not have a buyer as we did in, in the case of Bear Stearns. And so we were... Uh, we were, were faced with sort of an, un, an unfortunate set of circumstances. And I will conclude. I see the red light, Mr. Chairman, but I just want to say uh, if we have missed our oversight responsibilities, uh, I need to know what you consider in writing, and we'll put that in our, our letter to you, uh, what you consider government could do more of. I do know that we did not, this committee under the former administration did not do the kind of oversight. Maybe we were asleep at the wheel, or maybe we looked the other way. But I'd like to hear from you what government could do so we don't get in this situation again. And I think really it's worse than uh, the depression of the 30s. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for Thank the extra you very Thank the gentleman from California. I now yield to Mr. Garrett of New Jersey. And I thank the chairman. Thank you, Secretary. Good to see you. Um, before I begin, just to make a comment on, on one of your comments when I was walking in the room, you, with regard to AIG, um, saying that there was a gap in with regard to coverage, uh, not coverage, but gap with regard to authority um, and regulation there. We've had a number of panels uh, in financial services look at this, and th the bottom line is the, the takeaway that I've always heard is it's not a gap in authority, not a gap in regulation, that there were regulators there in place, but what they actually admitted to was they had the authority, they had the personnel, but you know what? They just missed it. Um, they weren't looking in the right places, um, and it was just an error on the part of personnel. And it may have been a gap in terms of capability that, when you that, look at the multiple regulators. That, that, that's probably a good way to phrase it. Um, one of the things that you have said, um, and others, and, uh, Secretary Bernanke as well, said is that what we needed here was resolution authority. Um, and that's what we need to answer her question going forward is resolution authority as well. But here's a question I'll pose for you hypothetically. Had we had resolution authority prior to the AIG situation, can you think and explain to me how it would be different? And I'll just posit two thoughts to you. If you had the resolution authority and they tried to move in and to try to um, um, firm in a more uh, quick, quicker manner, well, we know right now there is no real market out right there, and that would the same reason we're not doing it right now is put a more larger burden on the taxpayer, right? And if you did it, what they're doing now essentially is saying we're going to do it out over a period of time. There's still the threat of the problem over it. So help me understand why anything would be different significantly to the taxpayer and to the structure had we had a wind-down authority in place prior to the AIG situation. Um, yeah. With AIG, it was necessary to keep the current – the company didn't go through bankruptcy, right. kept the current – Kept the current corporate structure, right. worked within, uh, w worked within the legal framework. Right. Uh, the, the one thing that is similar is that the 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 Fed made a a, a loan, which is is going to be repaid as, right. as 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 pieces of the company are sold. But since I don't know, you know, in in, in terms of AIG, yeah. my role was in giving the Fed support as they made this decision. But once the, once the, the action was taken, I had 
no dealing. So I just don't know the okay. details. And I think probably the Fed would be better to answer that question for you in terms of what they're doing now and what they might do differently with, with, with the resolution authority. Okay. I, I only posit the question because I do know you were not on the scene after the fact, but I just yeah. posit the question because I know you have said in the past and here, too, I yeah, think yeah. that we need the wind-down authority. But I'm not really seeing, and that's, I haven't got my hands around from other witnesses right. as well, what would have been different in that situation. And now we have the situation, as you well know, um, with the CIT. Um, looking like that they are not going to be able to get a, a bailout, if you will. And so we're, we're, haven't we already set up the precipice, set up the situation, maybe going all the way back with Bear Stearns, that you create the conundrum of them saying that we look to the government to bail out, and under the administration proposals, they say we're only going to bail out the Tier 1 uh, entities, and CIT apparently just doesn't fall into that category, so they're not going to get the bailout. So you have a disincentive now, you have a, um, or a disservice to the taxpayer and a disincentive to the taxpayer that you're going to encourage companies like that in the future say, boy, I better get into that tier one situation again um, or else I'm not going to be, I'm going to fall into the CIT situation. Isn't that the problem with the, the administration's proposal? Well, I don't have all of the facts in terms of w w what has happened. When I was here, uh, the regulators made CIT a bank holding company. They came in with a regulatory recommendation to Treasury. We f we funded uh, we funded them out of TARP. I, I, I have lost touch. I don't know what's what, what's happened, but I understand the, uh, the 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 issue, the conundrum you've you, you've laid out, and that that is why really the only answer is we need to exit from all of these programs as soon as we can. Yeah, but my fear is is that we, and my question to you would be, are we not, would we not under the administration's proposal, and I know you spend some time looking yeah. at these things, basically perpetuating that situation going forward. Um, in other words, if we set the administration's plan into place and we begin to identify certain entities as being too big to fail, the tier one institutions, um, then the CITs of the world, and I know you may not be up to speed on, neither am I, and the particulars right there, um, but the CITs of the world will say, we want to get into that situation in the, fair, in, in the future. And that's what the basic underlying flaw in the administration's proposal, that you yeah. perpetuate the problem. Would you agree with that? Uh, I, I, I do agree that in one, one thing, that we, we, we don't want to move toward a, 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 a situation in this country where we, where we have certain or, organizations that are too big to fail and everyone else can fail. And we want to get to a situation where no one is too big to fail. Now, I'm not, I don't know enough about the CIT to, to, to jump to the same conclusion you are about that, but I understand the d dilemma you're pointing to. Yeah. And, Gentleman's and, time has expired. Okay. Uh, I indicated to Mr. Paulson that we would get him out. Um, uh, he has a plane to catch, so I'd like to now yield closing statement to um, the ranking member. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for this hearing, and I look forward to the reform part of our oversight and reform. And at this time, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the committee consolidate questions of the minority and my majority so that we can keep from overburdening uh, Mr. Paulson and still work with him to get follow-up answers. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Mr. Paulson, I personally want to thank you as a private citizen for coming here and giving us so much of your time and your insight into what happened at this very difficult time. Uh, there are unanswered questions. Uh, there are questions that we will never know. We will never know, had Merrill Lynch stayed on its own, stood on its own, and received, let's say, half of the TARP money that the combined company received, would it, in fact, today be a viable going concern? Would the backup plans envisioned by uh, the Treasury and the Fed, in case B of A were to uh, back out, would they, in fact, have worked? We'll never know that. Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you for your attempts to make sure we never had to know it. I, in fact, have been an outpo outspoken critic of some of the activities, including the threats. I am and will continue to be an outspoken critic of expanding the Fed's role beyond the monetary supply and giving them a direct uh, role in the systemic risk question. I do so because I believe that the Fed has a primary and premier obligation as an economic modeling organization. Well, you have a long history in mergers and acquisitions, understanding of what a, quote, good merger is and a bad merger is. Uh, that's not inherently a 
core talent that we expect to see in the Fed. So as we work to go forward to find the right models in case something like this happens again, and hopefully the right models to see it before it happens and prevent it, I hope you'll continue to be a resource for us because I do believe that the commission which has just been formed and this committee have an obligation to make sure we get it right so we don't have to do it again. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for this series and for your continued partnership on a bipartisan basis and particularly for your help today in making sure that everyone got their questions in, including those who have not yet asked them. And with that, I close and yield back and thank the Chairman. Thank you very much uh, for your, uh, your statement. Let me just say, uh, Mr. Paulson, again, thank you for coming, you know, but still there are some unanswered questions, you know, I, that uh, I would hope that maybe you could give it to us in writing uh, that, you know, uh, when they looked at the books at Merrill Lynch, they realized there was a $9 billion shortfall. Uh, this is according to Mr. Lewis. And then, of course, uh, this discovered further that uh, maybe it was, it was a $12 billion shortfall. But my question to you, and hope that you give it back to us in writing, because when I asked you earlier today, you didn't respond to it. Um, how did it get from $12 billion to $20 billion? I, I don't. I, there's, there's no real answer. To I, I can tell you that's one. I can tell you I can't give it to you in writing because I don't know. Uh, that what 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 I heard was a call on the 17th, where the losses were 18 billion pre-tax. Uh, by the 19th, there are 22 billion pre-tax, and what I said to people, that's a loss that takes my breath away. When the, the, the market hears that. Now, all I could say to you is December, the end of November and December were the worst months in the marketplace. And banks, it was the worst month for the economy. If you look at what was going on economically, it was the worst month in terms of the credit products and banks' losses. And so I, I didn't... When I looked at it, I wasn't shocked that this could have happened so quickly. But I, I don't have that explanation. You would have to get that from, from Merrill Lynch or B of A. Yeah, you know, I could see this if we were talking about millions. But yeah. we're talking about billions, like B and boy? Yeah, I mean. I, that, that was my reaction. I, I, I saw and witnessed things that, uh, that I never had seen before. And so... What, what was going on in the marketplace at that point in time, what, what B of A and Merrill subsequently explained to me was the, the, the products they had in inventory, the credit products, uh, there was a big erosion in value based upon what was going on in the markets. But I don't, I, I don't know. It was a, I, I heard about it for the first time on the 17th. Let me just uh, finish by saying, last year at the height of the financial crisis, major decisions were made about who was going to live and who was going to die. Lehman went down, but AIG was saved. Bear Stearns was sold off. Bank of America received billions. Nine big banks were forced to take billions. In many instances, they didn't even ask for. Most significantly, all of this was decided behind closed doors with no oversight. In a way, the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch deal illustrates the dangers of concentrating enormous power in only one or two individuals. When you turn over complete authority to the Treasury Department or the Feds, with no accountability and no checks and balances, this is what you get. Oral commitments involving billions of dollars, seemingly arbitrary decisions making, and residual suspicion. Mr. Paulson has stated that the principal regulatory agencies, the SEC and the FDIC, were consulted in this merger. I think it is clear that we need to hear next from the former SEC chairman, Mr. Cox, and from FDIC Chairperson Bear, to better understand the nature and extent of their participation. I intend to schedule a hearing for the purpose following the August recess. There's some unanswered questions here. 
And if we're going to reform our financial system, I think we need to have the answers to these questions. So, Mr. Paulson, I want to thank you for taking the time and come, and I hope that you will be become a resource in many, many ways to be able to help us to sort of unfold and get through this mess and to be able to come back stronger than ever before. Thank you so much for testifying. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.